расположенные обычно на освещениях дорог, на естественных рубежах, удобные для расположения войск и складов, играют важнейшую роль. This Russian narrator is explaining that fortified villages and cities play an important part in an enemy's defense plans. Soviet attack on such an area begins only after long and detailed study and exhaustive air and ground reconnaissance. According to Soviet military doctrine, towns must first be surrounded. The approaches to the fortified area are defended by a ring of pillboxes and communication trenches. These will be subjected to intensive artillery and airstrikes in preparation for the attack. The Soviet strives to build up a heavy numerical superiority in men and equipment during this phase. Strong points are plotted. The area is mapped in minute detail. Troops are trained in advance on similar terrain. Sometimes even models of enemy installations are constructed so that every soldier thoroughly understands his individual task. Often reconnaissance in force is used to locate fields of fire. These earth and timber strong points are part of the perimeter defense, about 1,000 yards from the city. The Soviets engage the strong points with direct artillery fire. They often fire at point-blank range. The intense bombardment attempts to disorganize the enemy's forward positions. The embrasures of the pillbox are the targets for the lighter Soviet weapons. Special assault teams are formed in trenches or in other concealed positions. These men are members of an obstacle clearing group made up of combat engineers. Their mission is to clear lanes through minefields and barbed wire so other troops may advance. Demining kits are issued as standard equipment. A squad of riflemen is usually attached to every obstacle clearing group. In addition to the obstacle clearing group, there is the shock group. This includes riflemen, heavy weapons personnel, and artillerymen, as well as engineers. This enemy pillbox is one of many surrounding the city. Other strong points are under similar attack. The obstacle clearing groups and shock groups seek out blind spots in enemy fields of fire. Both groups advance on orders from the commander of the assaulting rifle company. Artillery fire has isolated the area under attack. The Soviets are taught that no strong point can maintain uninterrupted fire. They take quick advantage of any lull or slackening of fire. They are adept in using concealment or covered routes of approach. Communist troops in Korea and Indochina were well trained in approaching strong points. The Soviets take advantage of any break in fire to move rapidly ahead. They work together, advancing by fire and maneuver, always aggressive, always closing with the enemy. The Soviets have and use considerable mine detection equipment, but if necessary, they will not hesitate to run a wave of men through an uncleared minefield. That, however, would hardly be shown in this Soviet-made training film. They are trained to remove obstacles and clear mines while under fire. This clearing of obstacles takes place during the air and artillery bombardment of the fortified area. The Soviet 76 mm regimental gun keeps the enemy bunker under direct fire. Guns of calibers up to 203 mm may be fired point blank. Soviet combat engineers attached to obstacle clearing groups clear lanes for the shock groups. The Soviets follow a time schedule in the assault. The shock group commander has established a simple code of signals within the group and with all supporting weapons.
often obstacles will be cleared and the shock group formed into an assault line under cover of darkness. The Soviet commander is told that support to adjacent units in the attack can best be accomplished by the continuous advance of his own unit. Individual strong points under attack are surrounded and cut off from support. Soviet chemical equipment is steadily improving. They are increasing their use of smoke in daylight operation. Enemy infantry attempting to protect the flanks of a strong point is blinded. The advance of the assault group is concealed by the smoke. Supporting this group are heavy machine guns, artillery, and a mortar platoon. Engineers carry explosives, cans of gasoline, wire cutting equipment, and two or three shoulder pack flamethrowers. This is the ROX-3 flamethrower. If smoke does not provide sufficient protection, assault trenches are dug. Sometimes the Soviet troops will dig themselves directly into the enemy position. Soviet support weapons concentrate their fire to cover the assault team. Now the shock group is in grenade throwing position. In Korea, the Chinese Reds often advanced unseen under heavy artillery support. Only when the lifting of the artillery barrage was followed by a rain of hand grenades would their presence become known. An enemy strong point may be crippled by artillery, but its ultimate capture depends on the infantry. An anti-tank grenade is used here. The mission of the supporting weapons is to harass and blind the embrasures of the pillbox while the shock troops advance. Each Soviet direct fire weapon is assigned a specific embrasure as a target. Combat regulations stress that the mission of the infantry is to close with and destroy the enemy. The Soviet soldier accomplishes this by an aggressive forward movement under the cover of heavy supporting fire. The grenade, known as the pocket artillery of the infantry, is used extensively by the Soviet soldier. Assault teams press aggressively forward, following up every and any advantage. Destruction of individual strong points disrupts the fire system of the enemy. It permits the infantry to penetrate through the gaps into the depths of the enemy defense. A successful forward movement of the squad must be instantly supported by the platoon with fire, grenades, and a bayonet charge, state Soviet combat regulations. Now the units move on against the city itself. Within the enemy's defense perimeter, the Soviets continue their encircling maneuver. Each shock group is assigned a specific area on the basis of careful prior planning. Key targets are designated for seizure by special target teams. Tanks now provide the momentum for the Soviet infantry directly behind them. Infantry and tanks attack as a single force, following a carefully coordinated plan. 
The T-34 tank with flamethrower is especially helpful in neutralizing fortified positions. The tank itself, or point-blank fire from its guns, destroys enemy emplacements. The mission of the tanks here is to support the assault troops. The infantry tank teams stay together and overrun the defense in a rapid, aggressive advance. Атакующие подвижные группы схода врываются на окраины, проникают, возможно, глубже и закрепляют. The mobile shock groups penetrate as deeply as possible, clearing the way for the rifle companies that follow. The Soviets attempt to isolate individual centers of resistance. The reinforced rifle battalion is the primary tactical unit in street fighting. From three to six special assault teams are created from each battalion. Movement along straight streets is avoided. Full use is made of windows, walls, back alleys, and gardens. Particular attention is paid to corner buildings, which are often key points for enemy resistance and observation. Observation and rapid movement are stressed again and again. Soviet regulations state that once an assault is begun, it must continue without stopping. They say the most dangerous element in combat is delay or await for orders. But this advice is not always followed, and in actual combat, individual units often show little initiative. The Soviet soldier is trained that a rapid forward movement using buildings and walls for cover is the best way to avoid mortar fire. This Soviet film demonstrates that finding an observation post is like finding a needle in a haystack. But the Soviets are patient and thorough in a situation like this. They are trained to scan carefully for enemy observers. Knock out the observer, they are told, and the effectiveness of the mortar is greatly reduced. Where is the enemy mortar observer? Windows, doors, holes in buildings, any potential hiding place must be carefully studied and then carefully searched. Enemy mortars rely on the directions of the observer. In street fighting, the Soviets stress constant pressure forward. They will dig through walls of buildings, tunnel under streets if necessary. For accurate automatic fire, the Soviets rely on the light machine gun, a rugged, simple weapon which is similar to our own automatic rifle. The Soviets emphasize the training for this type of fighting. They will expend great effort to capture a build-up area quickly. Where there is danger of anti-tank guns, the foot soldiers move ahead first, but the infantry is never more than 400 yards from its tanks. All available weapons provide support and covering fire for the advancing infantry. Individual assault teams move forward by bombs from building to building. Tanks and anti-tank guns provide close support by knocking out machine guns, clearing paths through walls and engaging enemy armor. Small enemy emplacements are quickly demolished. The Soviet flamethrower fires in bursts with a capacity of six or seven streams. Its range is approximately 30 yards. Frequently, flamethrower units will work in teams. Not only will the Soviets attack built-up areas in their line of march, 
but they will go out of their way to raid these areas in search of food or to convert them into defense positions of their own. Once the Soviets take possession of a city, it is difficult to dislodge them. The Soviet soldier is impressed that combat in built-up areas is full of unexpected situations in which survival depends completely on his own ability. Note that as part of his training, he is hardened to the idea that death is part of war by seeing Soviet soldiers killed in his own training films. Soviet basic infantry training stressed crawling, use of cover and concealment, and continuous observation. This standard machine gun will fire automatic or single round. The Soviet soldier is geared to simplicity. Note the mine detector attached to a rifle. Engineers clearing mines and booby traps, shock groups and artillery wiping out strong points of enemy resistance, all prepare the way for the main body of infantry that follows. An engineer plants explosives at an enemy blockade. Close coordination and mutual support between the infantry, artillery and armor are stressed in the attack. Soviet reconnaissance is continuous during the course of battle. Vulnerable spots are sought out for attack, while larger centers of resistance are left for the battalion reserve. The shock groups advance by leaps and bounds through the fortified positions. Each center of resistance is encircled, then wiped out. Moving along ditches, walls, behind buildings and through backyards, the shock groups advance as quickly as possible. Behind them, the infantry reserves mop up pockets of enemy resistance. It must be remembered that the Soviets' main objective is the complete destruction of the enemy. Whatever the cost in lives, they hold that only by continuous aggressive action by the infantry can the complete destruction of the enemy be achieved. The Soviet soldier is warned against booby traps and mines. He is taught to suspect the open path, the easy route. He knows it is better to take time to go over a wall and avoid the natural avenues of approach where mines, booby traps and enemy fire will be concentrated. Moving in groups of two and three, the infantry continues to press forward. Every building must be thoroughly searched and cleared for the troops that follow. The grenade is the Soviet's favorite weapon in close combat. Here he will use it in preference to calling for artillery fire and prefer it even to the heavier weapons of his own platoon. Tanks continue to give close support to the infantry by knocking out pillboxes and machine gun emplacements. The Soviets use artillery and tank support rather than tactical air support in this type of situation. Military forces facing a communist army must be prepared for tenacious fighting. Lacking many refinements of military procedure, their tactics, weapons and techniques are basic and simple, shaped to their own capabilities. The Soviet is told that toughness and the ability to close with the enemy are enough to crack any defense. Room by room, building by building, the assault groups are taught to continuously press forward, never allowing the enemy time to rest or regroup. Note the absence of any prisoners being taken during this phase of the advance. Hand-to-hand -hand combat is anticipated, and the Soviet soldier is trained to fight with a knife or with his bare hands if necessary. The 
Not only must the infantry continue to pursue the enemy, but it must also hold and defend what it has captured. Brick and stone buildings are preferred for defense positions. Communication nets are set up. Line companies have sound power telephone equipment. Any portion of a built-up area that is captured will be prepared for stubborn defense by the rifle company because these positions cannot be abandoned without orders from the battalion. Heavy weapons are brought up and dug in. Mines are laid in streets and fields. To be effective, minefields must be covered by anti-tank guns and infantry. The Soviets work on the theory that an enemy who has lost a favorable position is certain to try and retake it. They assume that a counterattack will come at once. Soviet anti-tank positions are usually established at street crossings and whenever possible have overlapping zones of fire. Everyone is ready and waiting. And here comes the counterattack. The Soviets prefer to meet a tank infantry attack by striking the enemy flank. But if the situation does not permit maneuver, they will wait until the very last moment and then open fire from very close range. An army facing communist forces soon learns a peculiarity of Soviet tactical doctrine. As you will see in a moment, they leave their positions and advance to meet the counterattack, shouting their battle cry. This Soviet-made training film, of course, shows a Soviet victory. The Soviets try to make robots out of Russians, but in actual combat, Communist troops are not as effective as they are shown to be in this film. Once the Soviets have captured the built-up area, they immediately move in reserve units to consolidate the position. Soviet doctrine in the attack of fortified positions and built-up areas has several main characteristics. There is long and thorough advance planning. The Soviets strive for a four to one superiority before the attack has begun. There is prolonged artillery preparation. The advance is made on narrow frontages with assault groups leading the main body of infantry. Strong artillery and armored support is provided for the assaulting unit. 